Right, Patrick, thank you for joining us. Um, we, we've really, really enjoyed the film. Uh, it's it, There's so much in it to enjoy. But for anyone who's not had the opportunity to see, let me get this right, 52577, what's it about? Leaving home, uh, leaving the nest, uh, going towards the undiscovered country of your dreams. And, and what it takes to really do that and whether it's worth it or not and what are you willing to sacrifice. But it's ultimately really a, um, a thank you note, a love letter, a valentine to a bunch of wonderful human beings that I grew up with and others that I met for the first time on a trip to Hollywood who were able to discern far better than I was my future. Okay. That's what it's about. Right. Well, about the title. So we, we, we've had a contact from someone. And I'm going to read this out uh -huh. to you. <laughs> and okay. it goes like this. Very short question. I'm British and I watched 52577. Can you please tell me what is the 25th month? And that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a question from Mr. Billy Sastard. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Help me out here. This because it just went in my head. A couple of neurons fired off in a way that they don't normally. Give me, give me a hint. I know this name. Uh, Billy Sasted. I think it's a spoonerism. Oh, I oh, Dort. Dort. Okay. Well, all right. So it's, it's early here. No. Okay. So, so, so the, no. It's funny because. I knew full well that the 52577 title, well, first of all, you have to understand that like many filmmakers in, throughout history, the people that were putting up the money and the people that were going to be distributing all had their ideas of what it should be called, right? And it went everything from semi-reasonable things like Fan One, which is what Gary Kurtz called me because he determined when he found out when I saw Star Wars, he said, oh my God, you're the first person that didn't work on it to ever see it. You know, and, and when I saw it, it's still, it just still the blue screens were not composited. It still had, you know, 633 Squadron and Dam Busters footage in the dogfight sequences. It had, you could hear David Prowse going, you weren't on any mercy mission this time. Several transmissions were intercepted by your ship. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like, it was all of it. There was new John Williams music. There was, there was some of the Ben Burt sound effects were temporarily there. But anyway, it, it, it so I said to the distributor, I said, let's do posters and ads and trailers and even the actual film itself. Why don't we just title it whatever the date was for the territory you're releasing in? So if it was, you know, if it had come out, I think it came out in July of, in, in England. Was yeah, that right? it was a, we, at that time, we were always getting the films a few months after America. Right. Right. And, and in other places, it didn't come out, you know, for a year, you know, until, you know, I mean, but, but um, so it could have been, so let's say it was July 27th, it would have been, you know, 27, 7, 77 or whatever, you know, and that would have been the title and everybody in England would have said, or in the UK would have said, oh yeah, I, I know where I was, you know, <laughs> but they just wouldn't go for it. And it was not, I, I thought it would have been a really fun little ruse, but anyway. So it is what it is. We kept it, you know, the upside down inverted. And Gary Kurtz used to lament it as well, even though he's an American. He lived in England the rest of his life after Star Wars. And and he was like, oh, got to answer to people going, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this title? So the, the film has kind of very much been uh, pitched as um, you being the first person to ever see it outside of kind of the guys at ILM and whatnot. Right. So of course. What were the circumstances then of you? getting to see that well that's the movie isn't it <laughs> I mean, all right well, but, but there's that one moment where you kind of without giving too much away and you you get to see it and with with uh you know everything is so restricted and tight uh, uh security wise these days yeah it was a different era then it it was comp well what's funny is it was different mostly in that there was no security I didn't have to sign any forms or have, you know, put my eye up to a scanner or, or give blood or, you know, I, I mean, literally it was just, you know, John Dykstra going, Hey, come on in guys, let me show you around. And, and, bec and because um, the egg company, um, the offices across from Universal Studios where Lucasfilm was centered at that time had been broken into 
the night before we got there for this interview that Herb Lightman was going to do for American Cinematography Magazine, the, what happened was John Dykstra walks in and he goes, Herb, I don't have anything I can give you to walk out of here with to print in the magazine that shows all this cool stuff that we're doing. Because all of their, it had been broken into and all of their slides and transparencies of the behind the scenes stuff had been stolen. And, so, and there were no digital backups. There was no such thing as digital backup. You got to remember that, that the most advanced computer that was working on Star Wars at the time ran off of a cassette tape drive. Literally, that was the data thing for this like Apple II or it wasn't even an Apple II. It was a, it was a, a Commodore or something. It was just some ridiculous, a K-Pro or something. And I think we're so, still working off one in the office, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so, well, and, and Herb was like, well, well, how am I supposed to describe a movie that I've seen nothing of? And John Dykstra's like, ah, this is after he gives us that big tour of the model shop and runs us through, you know, showing all these crazy things that have names that make no sense. And, and he's clearly hyper caffeinated. And by caffeinated, I, I, I use that word loosely um, <laughs> at the time, like, like the rest of the team trying to keep up with, you know, getting this thing ready for its release in two months. And he said, you know what, let me just take you up to the screening room and show you just a couple of little bits, you know, just so you'll get a sense of the movie. So, and in fact, I'm going to share my screen with you, if that's okay. I'll show you the very first shot I ever saw of Star Wars. And um, so you have to understand that I was ushered into, you know, this upstairs screening room at ILM that was filled with like old couches they probably found on the you know the exits of the freeway <laughs> yeah. you know and and popcorn on the floor and this hand strung screen and and this steam powered projector in the back with a pull start you know and they had a rough basically they had you know a work print a print of the work print yeah. um that they would run every day and check the stuff they were doing against the action sequences within the film that they were cutting into and so he he shows this first shot that I've just sent you, and um, there's no music. There's as like I said, and there's very little sound effects. The blue screens are still blue. When the when the X wings are rocking, you can see the grips outside moving them around, and there's light stands and the whole. And we're like, what the hell? You can hear Kenny Baker swearing his ass off inside our <laughs> TV. It's like, it's here, you know, get me out of here. <laughs> and um, it was it was still magical. I mean, when it was over, we looked at each other, Herb and I, we got back in his car, this little Honda Civic, and we sat outside ILM at this little nondescript little warehouse in the middle of nothing, Van Nuys, California on a hot summer day. And we looked at each other and we're like, we're the only ones to know. <laughs> we're the only ones, which was good and bad until you get home to your little town of 750 people. And they don't even believe you went to California, let alone that you saw some movie that has the silliest title they've ever heard. Star Wars made people just bust up laughing. It just sounded like Flash Gordon, you know, which is exactly, of course, what, what Gary and, and, and George wanted. But um, I, I, it's hard to describe because there was no such thing as fandom. There was no such thing as knowing about Star Wars. There were, there were no big magazines yet that that covered all of this except i mean starlog was out there you know yeah. but it wasn't like they announced star wars a year ahead of time or anything um and and it it, it it i i felt like i had to convince everybody in my little town to see this so that either a they would all show up on opening night and enjoy it and i'd be a hero yeah. or at least even if they didn't go with me that day if they saw it it would change the town enough that i would not have to leave it <laughs> so that certainly comes over in the film matt but um you, you've mentioned gary kurtz now unfortunately he's you know no longer with us unfortunately but um right. how did he get involved did you approach him and did he when he was on board did he manage <laughs> to facilitate a lot of stuff that ordinarily you would never have had oh, any yeah. chance with but well, both he and Fred Roos, uh, who were dear friends, um, uh, helped. And it all started because, well, two things happened. One, I met uh, Fred long before I met Gary uh, because Fred had been shown by my agents um, a rough cut of, we're well, not going to rough cut, almost the final version of, of Space Invaders. And if you love it or hate it, 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 it certainly, we, the people that 
were involved, everyone from John Knoll on his first visual effects outing as a supervisor uh, and, and best man at my wedding and vice versa. And oh, someone, really? someone I grew up with. Oh, yeah, as a model maker, we grew up together, basically. And, and uh, you know, I was in his basement when he and his brother were coding Photoshop back in, you know, 1988 or whatever it was. And, um, and but, but what happened was Fred Roos was so impressed with Space Invaders, he said, listen, um, your movie, Dollar for Dollar, because it was made for $1.75 million in a warehouse in North Hollywood, and, and yeah. it takes place on the farmlands of Illinois at night with Martians and spaceships and everything. And yes, it's silly and, and goofy, but Steven Spielberg liked it enough to get it distributed, so that didn't hurt. Um, but, but what happened was rumors spread. Fred heard about it, he saw the movie, took me, took me to lunch and he said, your movie, Dollar for Dollar, has more production value than any film I've ever seen. And he, and he goes, you're going to tell me how you did it. And so I spent the next two hours at this lunch telling him how we did it. And he goes, all right. And so he goes, nice meeting you. See ya. And I'm thinking, okay, well, off I go. On my way home, my agent calls and I pick up the car phone. <laughs> and I'm... <laughs> and I, I think I've still got that happened? phone as well. <laughs> yeah. And he says, he says, well, I don't know what you told Fred. I said, just the truth. And he goes, well, he's, he wants you to go meet a friend of his for lunch tomorrow. Um, are you available? And and I I started to think about what was going. On. He goes he goes Patrick, you're available. I said really why? And he goes it's George Lucas he wants to take you to actually to breakfast. He goes not lunch, but he says uh, he says yeah you're meeting at the Bel Air Hotel um, for breakfast tomorrow with George. And I was like, <laughs> so I go to this breakfast and it's and and by the way that night I get sent a script called Radio Land Murders. Um, that George is about to produce and is looking for a young director who he can you know, kind of supervise and look over the shoulder of. And I was a yeah. young director who just, but now, now, so what happens is on the way over to this breakfast, I determined that the only way I'm getting this job is if I never say the word star and the word wars within the same five minute period. Okay. Right. I can say star, I can say wars, I just can't say them anywhere near each other, right? So for this entire breakfast, which is meant to be like 15 minutes long and turns into like a two-hour geek fest between <laughs> these two nerds, um, I, I talk about the script, I talk about the project, I never mention what happened in this story that you were seeing in this movie, I never bring any of it up, I don't mention that I know anybody other than his friend, friend you know, his friend Fred Roos, and I, I mean, as I'm driving home, my agent calls and goes, what did you do? And I said, oh, well, am I in trouble? He goes, no, George loved you. Why? He goes, he goes, this director you sent me, has he seen Star Wars? You know, he's like, he never mentioned it. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and George loved that. So from that point on, like, I would run into George at these various functions in Hollywood, you know, and, and George kind of like me would kind of stand in the corner and watch people dance <laughs> at the premiere and have a drink and you know wave a little and talk but you know anytime i'd see me they'd be like oh hey patrick hey and we'd start talking geek stuff again <laughs> so i had that going when i went after a book um a sci-fi book that i really wanted to option when i had my deal at universal um and it was called Santiago by a wonderful writer, Mike Resnick. And it was kind of a hearts of darkness in space kind of thing, almost apocalypse now in space sort of thing. And it was beautifully done and really cool and amazing. And I went after the rights and found out that Gary Kurtz was going after the rights. Now, I'd never met Gary, but I, we did have a mutual friend in a guy named Ed Elbert who produced like Anna in the King and things like that. And he's a great a super guy. And he said, well, he goes, why do you guys, you guys shouldn't compete. You guys are like, bosom buddies and you just don't know it yet let's get you in a room so right. he arranged this like summit meeting between gary and i and sure enough gary and i got going and blah blah blah, blah and by you know we spent two and a half hours three hours yammering away and we decided let's go get the book together and we did and we got universal to pay for the rights and we started developing and hiring writers and the whole thing it never ended up getting made but that's another story and it, it still should it would make an incredible series um the streaming series but anyway so because of that gary and i gary actually moved into my offices at universal i had this you know because i was steven's fair-haired boy now because he 
gotten Disney to pick up Space Invaders, I had they were giving me everything. Giant offices, bigger than Tom Cruise's. You know, I had all the I had the most advanced computer systems on the entire lot. I had my own, I could I could screen any movie I wanted anytime at the Hitchcock Theater just to do research. You know, it was like yeah. I was being I was flavor of the month in Premier magazine. Ooh. So so all this stuff was happening. And Gary and I would go out to lunch a lot and just talk about movie ideas, you know, things we would like to develop. And one day I pitched him something called Goodbye Yellow Brick Road which was my version of American graffiti for kids in the 70s, not kids in the 50s and 60s. You know, it's just my generation's American graffiti. Yeah. And it was basically a lot of the stuff you see in my film now, but without any of the connection to Star Wars, because at the time I was pitching it to Gary, two things were going on in my head. I didn't want to pitch anything to do with Star Wars because there was no such thing as more Star Wars at this point. It yeah. was kind of spelled. You know, it was kind of put away. It was, they, they, they've done the three movies. And, 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 and Gary, I don't think, wanted to go down that road anyway. And I also thought, you know what? It's such a, a heavy lift to get people to understand what that event was all about, that I'm just trying to do a slice of life, coming of age story, but with 70s music in, in the Midwest, right? And Gary's like, yeah, it sounds great. And I know why you want to do it. That's why George and I wanted to do American Graffiti. But he goes, we've done it, you know, and you, it stopped. He goes, that's not for me. And I thought, okay. And I went, wait, there's one other little, little thing I didn't tell you. And that's when I told him about how I came to see Star Wars. Right. And he goes, <laughs> wait a minute. He goes, and I told him the whole story. And he's like, he, he goes, what day did you see it? I said, that, you know, is this day? And he goes, you're the first person that didn't work on it to see it. You're the very first civilian to ever see the film. Yeah. And he goes, you're, you're fan one. And, and I was like, yeah, but I mean, I mean, we don't have to. I mean, that, that's, people, that's a big, that's some bragging rights I don't know anyone can live up to because I'm not the biggest fan. I don't own any action figures. I don't have, you know, I don't. I've gone to a couple of the conventions and kind of stood in the corner, you know, I don't dress yeah. up, I, you know, I'm not in the 501st, I'll do, I have a challenge coin somewhere around here. Um, but, but because, and, and he said, you know, that's the story you need to tell. I mean, that's going to, you're going to get that made in a second. It'll, you know, everybody will well, get snapped up just like that. <laughs> Got to do 20 years later. Um, but, and so, and Gary said, look, you know, the stuff that you want to use with, you know, from Star Wars, I can help you with, obviously, you know, and he goes, and I can call George and, and he goes, and George knows you and you guys stand around in the corner and talk, talk movie junk whenever you're hanging out. He likes you. John Knoll is now, uh, you know, by this point, John Knoll is not running ILM, but he's running the new Star Wars films, the prequels, you know, in terms of visual effects. And mm. so it's all kind of triangulated correctly. And sure enough, um, when the time came that we needed the rights to use all the material that we do use from Star Wars in the film, um, Gary was nowhere to be found because he was off in Siberia scouting locations on a film. And I needed the permission to get into the Hamptons International Film Festival to prove that I had the, the rights to this material. Oh, right. Yeah. Right? And we couldn't find Gary because he was off doing Gary stuff. And <laughs> so I called up John Knoll and I said, John, I really need your help. And he's like, eh, what's going on? And I, and I said, well, <clears throat> do you think you could go and show George the pertinent material from our film. He doesn't have to watch the whole thing, just the sequences that involved ILM and Star Wars. And he goes, oh yeah, no problem, I'll, I'll call you back. And so like six hours later, I get a phone call and he goes, yeah, I, I went up to the big house and I brought my, my laptop and a DVD of your rough cut and I showed him all the stuff. And I said, you know, Patrick wants to know if he can use this stuff. And, and he said, George looked at him and looked down at the screen again, looked at him and goes, I think the answer is yes. And <laughs> The next day, we got a letter from Lucasfilm legal department saying you now have the rights to, throughout eternity across the galaxy for all time to use this material in your film. So just, Lucas was on magic board, right from the start, which is good. But then this film has had such a protracted history in terms of making it, of shooting it, doing oh. a bit more <laughs> pickups then years later, the effects. Was there ever a time when you just kind of got to the stage of thinking oh sod this i'm not doing any more that's it i can't bear this anymore there were times when i got so close to that edge that i could not stare into it 
into that abyss. Yeah. Because that abyss would have would have undone the belief of everybody from the people who put up the first hundred and twenty thousand dollars with which we shot 70 for 75 percent of the film was shot for a hundred and twenty thousand dollars wow that's how resourceful my team was and how much was given and how much all those cars all those costumes all those locations which by the way the locations except for the high school which was inadvertently or advertently burned to the ground by some graduates just after my class got through um the every location in the film is the actual location where every event i mean every event occurred oh right yeah that living okay. that living room floor that's yeah. where that's where the magic happened <laughs> <laughs> well now you see that kind of brings me on to the next bit is that um in the film you recreate scenes right which you have shot but mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering how difficult was it to recreate scenes that you recreated it when you were much younger? Well, that is a funny thing. I, mean, I love this question because, you know, we have three levels of visual effects in this film. We have the invisible effects that people don't even know were effects. And there's, there's hundreds of them in the film. Everything from split screens to make two different performances from different takes match up the way we want them to, to, you know, correcting someone's eye line, to putting, to getting rid of a modern, you know, stop sign or a stoplight that doesn't fit to all that, yeah. including, you know, three or four shots that John Knoll did for me on his home computer when he was off work at IOM, like, you know, the cloud tank. Oh. The cloud tank in reality was just a frame with some fiber fill clouds in it on <laughs> strings. And, and, and one half of the Waldo, the atomic energy arm, and and us pulling back on it, and we're like, we'll figure it out later. And we send it to John. He goes, oh, yeah, I can, I can put the rest in. And he's the one who put in the lights and the you know, moving clouds and the other half of the arm that's injecting the dye. You know? And, and yeah. then the, the, the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star surface were not there. We couldn't afford them. In fact, we didn't even have an ILM set 24 hours before we needed to shoot it because there was a huge miscommunication with the art department, and they just... I, I got there the day before shooting to scout it and it wasn't built. It it was just empty, I mean, a giant empty warehouse with a bunch of lumber and PVC pipe and 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 blue screens still folded on the floor and 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 you know model kit parts everywhere and models that had been shipped from all over the world. You know, various model makers, Star Wars fans had shipped us the land speeder and the and the and the, the Tantive 4. And but what the amazing thing was this guy, Rick Inglesby who had built such a beautiful Star Destroyer replica that Lucasfilm would often rent it and use it to take around on promotional tours as the Star Destroyer. Yeah. And, and it, 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 it was such an accurate, beautiful model. I, I loved it. We begged him. We said, could we you know, pay to have it flown out and, and we'll take good care of it. We'll insure it and everything. He goes, oh, no, I'll just drive it out. You know? And so he drove from Buffalo, New York to Chicago with his model in the back of his car. And he came in for like five days while we were shooting all the Close Encounters stuff. He's he's sitting in the corner just with his model in a box, you know, just sort of guarding it, you know, but also watching and being, you know, because he was an independent filmmaker in his own right and a, and a model geek and a Star Wars nut. And finally, on that day when I walked in and there was no set, I I I just was apoplectic and I didn't know what to do. And I and the art department were like, I don't think we can shoot tomorrow. And on a film our size, we had first of all. We had Austin Pendleton only for three days. We could only have him for three days because he was he was directing a play at Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. And you're not even technically allowed to do any other work when you work for Steppenwolf. They can fire you for even doing like a TV commercial for a day. Yeah. And, and he was so enamored of the material um, because it was Bob Balaban that I wrote it for. And Bob couldn't do it because he was doing Gosford Park. And so he... He, he called up Austin and said, I got to send you something. And Austin read it and called Bob back and he said, I have to speak these words. And so he risked his, he was doing this play and he called up Steppenwolf and said, I, I know that it's technically not allowed contractually, but I'm going for three days to this set to make this little independent movie. You can fire me if you want, but I'm going. And they were like, no, 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 no. Okay, God damn it, you called our bluff, you know. And and often, you know, there he was. So, but the problem was we didn't have a set for the closing, you know, for the ILM. And, and, and so I look over at Rick Inglesby 
and I, I just walk up to him and I say, Rick, and I'm just like about to, you know, heal over here. I'm just like, it's all over because if, you, if we didn't get it done that day or the next day, we'd never get it, at least not with Austin being there, right? So I said, you see all that lumber and all that PVC pipe and those 20 carpenters standing there staring at us with big weepy kitty cat eyes? Okay. If I field promote you from really cool guy who drove his model from, you know, New York State uh, to Chicago to production designer of the ILM set, can you build it in 24 hours? And he looked at me and goes, yeah. <laughs> and then he did it. <laughs> and you saw it, you know, it was amazing. Having the inside, uh, you know, the insider and the first view to Star Wars and right. having had so much uh, uh, support from Gary Kurtz and from George Lucas, you surely must have one piece of knowledge, if not many, about Star Wars or the process or the stories behind it that no one else knows. What would that be? I'm trying to think of the things I can say that that won't get me in trouble, but uh, but are also salient enough and interesting enough that people will say, well, I didn't know that. Um, well, I can, t <laughs> well, first of all, I will say there was never an intention for nine movies, never. There was never an intention for more than one movie. The whole idea was that George and Gary wanted to do Flash Gordon, but they couldn't get the rights. And, and and I don't know if you know, if De Laurentiis had already bought them or to pick them up, but for whatever reason they couldn't get the rights. They're like, well, all right, we'll do it anyway. We'll just do our version. <laughs> you know, we'll just make it up. You know, and that, that's more. I think more people know that one. The the well, here's one, and and Carrie wouldn't mind my saying this. Um, in if you ever saw postcards from the edge, there's that moment where she's on set. And it's not on Star Wars on in the movie, but it was when she's hiding in the rack of clothes, hearing them talk about her weight issues and you know breast size and all that, and okay. and she's literally hiding between dresses to listen in. That that actually occurred on the set of Star Wars. That really happened. Gary was the founder, um, hiding there. And it, okay. it really did happen. And and I know Carrie wouldn't mind my telling it because she, she and I had, had a, Carrie was actually going to play my mom in this movie originally. Okay. And, and Mark Hamill was actually going to do a cameo in a part that, that got cut from the film anyway. Um, but it was Mark that kind of talked some sense into us. Carrie loved the part. But one of the things that I noticed I was starting to do and that Mark, and well, Mark didn't read this, but he worried about it. He said, he said, I'm sure Carrie will do this. And and, and, and Fred Roos said he thought, yeah, Fred said there was a part that he thought Harrison would do one day only in Harrison's garage, you know, because Harrison credits Fred Roos with his entire career because oh. it was Fred who who put him in front of George and said, Han Solo. And, and George is like, no, 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 no. We've already done him. He was Bob Falfa. We're not doing that. -uh. But then Fred, there's a great story I'll tell another time about, about how Harrison actually got that part and it's wonderful it has to do with carpentry um and, oh, and any it's a great I, I think story. I know this one you but... may know okay yeah but so so at any rate um so we had um Harry was going to do it Mark said he'd be happy to do a cameo but he said if one out of ten people think it's a stunt he said, you've got a really nice script here that's like, it's really, it's a good story. It's, it works on its own. It doesn't need stunt casting and cameos and wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. You know, it doesn't need any of that. And he said, I'll do it, but ask yourself if it's worth it. Because if people get taken out of the story, and so by the end, we decided, you know, Colleen Camp was the better way to go. And, and plus at that time, Carrie was busy doing all kinds of other things and getting ready for you know, other things that she was yeah. going to do. And, you know, but it was, she was lovely. And she was one of the funniest people I ever met in my life. I'll tell you another story when we get together uh, that, <laughs> okay. about Carrie, that, that she wouldn't mind my telling. So finally then, um, Star Wars fans are notorious for being fanatical and there's nothing that they don't know. Of course. In, in your film, have they, have you been picked up on anything? And here's your chance to counter it. 
Wow. Well, if it's if it, when it comes to Star Wars, I'm trying to think of the things. There was somebody pointed something out about. Um, and give me a second because I, I it's just it's flashing through my head. There was there was something about. Well, no, no, I, I think we I, I I don't think anyone's picked up anything that we missed or didn't do right regarding Star Wars. What I do think. I mean, for example, there's a roller coaster at the Great America theme park that that wasn't there when we when it was built two years after the story. Oh, you know, I mean, there's things like that. But we, as far as I can tell, I think we we pretty much nailed it, and it didn't hurt that we had Gary Kurtz as the creative consultant and John Knoll. You know, because between the two of them, there's nobody that can compete with the two of them. You know, in terms of their knowledge. Well. I'm going to ask you to squeeze one quick last one in. Sure. So this is about the Star Wars trilogy. Are mm. we? Are you going to be seeing doing one about the Phantom Menace trilogy? No, but I will tell you this: there is talk already, and I'll send you the graphics for this if you'd like. Um, there is talk already of doing two sequels to my film. Oh. And and everybody involved is interested. One of the things you have to remember is we have about five more hours of material that's not in the film, right? And and if you can imagine twenty year old or nineteen year old John Francis Daly in flashbacks against now thirty eight year old John Francis Daly, the the first one is called Five Twenty Five Ninety: The Empire Strikes Pat, which is about my decade in Hollywood, right? Right. Well, actually almost two decades in Hollywood. It's about from the Pinto arriving to the to the family leaving, you know, me and my children and my wife and leaving back to Wadsworth when I quit Hollywood. It ends like empire in, in, in horror and sadness and destruction. And then 52504, Return of the Alumni, is <laughs> the story of all of my remaining friends in Hollywood and my friends from high school all gathering together in Wadsworth, Illinois to make 52577. Brilliant. <laughs> well, Patrick, it's absolutely been so enjoyable talking to you and I've really oh, enjoyed it. Pleasure. Stories. And when you're I, in I, London, we are going for a drink. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I'll let you know because I think it's going to be late June, early July, something like that. Maybe we'll do a little Guy Fox thing or something. You know? yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Patrick, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure talking to you. Bye.